How's it going, everyone? As always, God bless you and thank you for being here. I'm Gage and this is Candy Coral Aquatics. If you're new to my channel, please think about subscribing and tapping that notification bell. This is where I talk about all things reefing, but more importantly, where I share the information I've gathered on my tank with you guys to help you become better hobbyists at the hobby we call reefing. If you're already a subscriber and you're back for more, I just want to say thank you very much for being here and coming back to watch more of my videos. Today's video is being made from as a request from a fellow subscriber who is wanting to know how to lower phosphate in the aquarium. So this particular person is having an issue with really high phosphates and not enough nitrates. So let's go ahead and talk for a second about phosphates and then I'm gonna give you guys some ways to remove the phosphates. So what you need to understand about phosphates, first of all, is we're introducing them into the aquarium, right? They don't just show up. It's something that we are doing um, as the hobbyist that is introducing these phosphate levels into the water. <clears throat> so there's a few main reasons as to how phosphate gets into the water. Number one, and primarily I think the most common, is the types of food that we're feeding. Now, unfortunately, every food on the market, whether it's frozen, fresh, or flake food, is going to have some level of phosphate in it. So what we need to identify is how much and how often are we feeding? Because that tends to be the primary reason why phosphates are as high as they are. Nine times out of 10, it's because somebody is overfeeding, there's too much food left over in the aquarium, it's rotting, and then it's creating this unorganic phosphate. So that being said, take a look at your fish. A good way to identify if you need to cut back or not is the overall health of your fish. If your fish are nice and fat and healthy, go ahead and skip some feedings, cut back. I only feed my fish once a day or once every other day. And it, is, you know, it sounds mean because we're used to eating multiple times a day. It's not the same thing with fish here, okay? You can, you can skip a couple of days and they're gonna be just fine. The way that you can determine whether your fish is getting enough food or not is simply by looking at the stomach of the fish. If the fish is nice and fat and round and healthy, then you know they're getting plenty to eat. If the stomach is shrunken in, um, then you know you need to feed a little bit more. And that's what I use to identify whether or not I'm feeding enough to my fish. And all my fish are very fat and happy and I've never had any disease whatsoever in this tank. Everybody's doing really well. And like I said, I'll feed once a day or I might even skip a couple of days and then go ahead and feed that third day um, and everybody stays fine. Because what you have to understand again is as tanks mature, excuse me, as tanks mature, there's natural food sources within there, film algae on the rocks and the glass uh, that, you know, the yellow tang and the angelfish in my tank can eat. And then everybody else can munch on like copepods and other little crustaceans that naturally form as the tank matures. So don't be afraid to skip a feeding or two to get your phosphates under control. And portion control is also huge. If you're somebody that doesn't feel comfortable uh, without feeding your fish every day, then cut way back on the portions. A good general rule of thumb is a fish's stomach is about as large as their eye is. So if you're putting, you know, brine shrimp or, or mysis shrimp into the water, theoretically that fish only needs a couple of shrimp and he's going to be just fine. So don't go and dump a whole bunch of stuff in there when you're already having high phosphate levels because fish really don't need to eat as much as you might think that they do. The next way that phosphate is introduced into the aquarium is the water that we're using. So you guys have heard me say this many times before where clean water from day one is one of the staples of long-term success. You can't have a successful reef tank if you're using dirty water. It's just not going to work. So this is going to, you know, kind of dictate that you go out and either buy your, your own RO system where you can make your own fresh RO water at home or that you're buying your water from a reliable source, whether it's another reefer or whether it's your local aquarium shop, make sure that you're getting good, clean RODI water to mix your salt with. A good way to test whether it's clean or not is simply go online. You think you can get them on Amazon. They're called a TDS meter. T is in Tom, DS meter. So what you can actually do is you can order one of these for about 20 bucks, okay? get shipped to your door and you can actually test your sink water and you can see how much TDS is in your sink water, your tap water. And then you can go ahead and test your RO water. And if it's good RO water, you're going to see a vast difference uh, between the TDS of your tap water and the TDS of your RO water. Now what TDS stands for is total dissolved solids. So what this meter is measuring is everything that's in the water that is not actually H2O. That's not water. So this could be anything, which is why it's so important that we're using RODI water 
um, reverse osmosis deionized water because what that does is through that process it's stripping everything out of the water even um, you know the minerals that us as human beings need but our fish don't so it's making zero tds water it's taking everything out and just giving you water that super clean water that's just nothing but pure water is then what we're going to be adding to the aquarium and that's how we're going to get the best chance at making sure we don't have phosphates and it's going to give us the best chance at long-term stability because then when we mix in a high quality salt mix we're getting pure salt water um, full of all these good elements from the from the you know the salt that we're using or whatever it is that we're dosing and then of course it's going to be phosphate free because our water source is phosphate free now, the third way that phosphate can get introduced into the aquarium is the salt that we're using. So when it comes to water changes, there's two things we have to look at. The source water, you know, which is what we just talked about, and then the salt that we're using. So if, if you know that your source water is good RODI water, it's got a very, very low TDA, TDS, zero or as close to zero as possible, then we know that the water is not the issue. So once we test the water and we know that the water's good, the next thing that we need to do is add our salt, mix it up, and then test the salt water to see if the salt water contains phosphates before we add it to the aquarium. You might find out that the brand salt that you're using contains high levels of phosphates. And if that's the case, you need to switch your brand of salt. Now that we've identified the three main ways as to how phosphate gets into the tank, let's talk about phosphate in general and how we're going to get rid of it. So there's organic phosphate and there's inorganic phosphate. The inorganic phosphate is the stuff that's going to be causing all the issues, okay? That's the stuff that we're pretty much gonna be measuring for. That's the stuff that's going to cause the algae blooms, um, the browning out of corals, you know, stress on the fish, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so how do we know that we have high levels of phosphate? Well, if you haven't tested for it, some indicators that you have high levels of phosphate is algae blooms. Now don't confuse this with the thin layer of film algae that develops on the glass. That's just something that everybody gets because everybody has a little bit of nutrients in the water and everybody is running some type of high powered light. So we're always gonna have film algae that we need to be scraping off you know, every day or every other day. That's just something that happens. But when I'm talking about algae blooms, I'm talking about you know, uh, the, the brown hair algae, the green hair algae, the cyanobacterias, you know, all this stuff that can form because we have high nutrients, not always just because of phosphates. So if you're getting a lot of algae into the aquarium, you're getting a lot of algae blooms, um, then it's a pretty good indicator that you have high phosphates. The other you know, sign or symptom that will tell you that you have high phosphates is if your coral is turning brown. So corals do actually consume phosphates, okay? They actually need phosphates and as, as a food source. And what can actually happen is high levels of phosphates can actually promote the growth of zooxanthellae inside the coral, which is actually what the coral uses to get energy from the light. But the problem is, is when the phosphate levels are too high and this causes too much growth of zooxanthellae within the coral, the coral actually turns brown because that is the natural color of zooxanthellae is brown. So if you have corals that are browning out or turning, you know, really dark in coloration, that is also an indicator that you have high phosphate levels. Another indicator of high phosphate levels is when your coral calcification, the coral growth of hard stony corals completely stops. If you're not getting calcification anymore, high levels of phosphate inhibits coral growth and inhibits calcification of hard stony corals. So that is another indicator that you have high phosphates. So now that we know where the phosphates come from and some of the signs and symptoms of high phosphates, how do we get rid of it? There's a multitude of different reasons and chemicals are usually the first thing that people reach for, but I'm gonna give you guys some natural ways to reduce phosphate levels before we talk about chemical ways. So one of the easiest ways and most inexpensive ways to remove phosphate is water changes. Water changes solve a lot of different issues. As long as we're making sure that our source water is clear of phosphates and our salt is clear of phosphates, you can really never do too many water changes. So if you're experiencing really high levels of phosphate, Right now, you need to do a water change. 
Um, you know, if, if you have extremely high levels of phosphate and your tank is used to very high levels of phosphate, what you're going to want to do is several small water changes over the course of maybe a week or so. Don't go in there and do a huge change because even though your levels are really bad and your tank's probably suffering because of it, it still would kind of be a shock to the coral and livestock that you have in the tank. So what I would suggest is maybe do like a 10% water change every other day for maybe a week or two and then we can slowly cycle out all that water that's in that tank so water changers are always something that you you have in your toolkit they're very safe you know and they fix a lot more problems than just high phosphates the next thing that we can do to remove phosphates from the aquarium is protein skimming however it's important to know that organic phosphates cannot be removed from protein skimming only inorganic phosphates. But that's okay because it's really the inorganic phosphates that's causing the issues anyways. So if we're doing good protein skimming and we're removing a lot of that stuff in the water that's that broken down nutrients, that dissolve nutrients before it really has a chance to start a lot of issues and raise the phosphates, then we're already ahead of the game. So protein skimming is a very excellent, natural, and cost-effective way to remove phosphates from the water. Another effective way that we can remove phosphates from the water is kind of rinsing the foods that we use before we administer them into the tank. So a lot of your frozen food, if you guys notice when you add it into the tank, it's very cloudy. So all that cloudy stuff, we can actually thaw the food, put it into a small fish net, take a little cup of water out of the aquarium and rinse that food in that fish net and then add the food to the aquarium. So we're adding a lot less nutrients that way. A lot of people, including myself, like to add that dirty, you know, water to the tank from the food thawing because the corals can benefit from it. But if you're somebody who's experiencing really high phosphate levels, it's my recommendation that you rinse your frozen food with fresh water from your aquarium after it's thawed before you put it into the tank. Another way that we can actually kind of cut back on phosphates is with a refugium. So if you have a refugium or your tank is set up for a refugium, a lot of macroalgaes and decorative, you know, macroalgae consume phosphate. So it's not just the bad stuff that likes phosphate. A lot of the nice decorative stuff also likes phosphate. So if you're able to set up an, a refugium of some kind, macroalgae is another really good natural way of removing phosphates. When all else fails, you can use chemicals like GFO to remove phosphates. However, use them sparingly. I do use GFO in my tank and I've used it for a long, long time. Um, and I have not had any issues. But what I would recommend is you use about half of the dose that is recommended and then kind of step it up from there. So if, let's just say for easy easy numbers here, let's let's say it's telling you to use uh, a cup, okay, a cup of, of GFO, which is not going to, a cup is, is a lot, but I'm just trying to make this simple. A cup of GFO. Well, let's use a half a cup and then see where we are. We'll go ahead and in a, you know, in a week or whatever, a few days, we'll go ahead and test our phosphate level. If our phosphate level has come down, um, then just continue to let the GFO run and make sure it's not going back up. If it's going back up, then that's an indicator that the GFO is exhausted and it needs to be exchanged out. But you know, let's say you, you put it in a few days, you test it, it's come down. A few days more, you've tested it, it's come down. We'll then test it again a few days later, make sure it's still going down. So the desirable phosphate level is 0.03 to 0.05. Um, you can get as high as 0.08 and you should be okay, but you don't really wanna go much higher than that, okay? So 0.03 to 0.05 is natural seawater. That's where we wanna try to be. Um, so GFO is, is a good thing um, to use when all else fails, but what you guys really wanna do is you want to maintain uh, a natural way of removing these the, the phosphates first before you switch to chemicals. And then the final um, kind of tool that I have for you guys in the toolkit of removing phosphate is carbon dosing. So you can carbon dose and what carbon dosing does is it creates like this carbon molecule in the tank that promotes the growth of a specific type of bacteria that will actually consume and or eat up these phosphates. Um, these organic and inorganic phosphates, and then we can actually skim both the organic and the inorganic phosphate out of the water because we're going to be skimming uh, that bacteria out, is I believe how it works. So the bacteria is going to capture up and eat up these phosphates, and then we can remove that with water changes or we can skim it out all entirely.
entirely. But if you're somebody who's trying to get your nitrates up, carbon dosing is probably not going to be good for you because carbon dosing will actually lower both nitrates and phosphates. So if you're somebody that has high phosphates and low nitrates, go ahead and use all the natural methods that I've just given you and then try the GFO if you have to. And then by doing that, you can lower your phosphates and also raise your nitrate level. Now to raise your nitrate level, you have to be careful with this because to raise nitrates, you're gonna kind of also be raising phosphates. So how we get higher nitrates in the water is again by having more waste in the water, okay? More stuff to break down into nitrates. So this is an increase in feeding, adding more fish to the tank, you know, things that are going to be creating waste. Um, so if you're somebody that has really high phosphates and really low nitrates, what I would focus on first is removing the phosphates as much as possible before you even worry about the nitrate level. Nitrates are important in an aquarium, but your corals will be very happy at five to 10 parts per million of nitrate. So as long as you're around that area, I would not even worry about nitrates. I would focus on getting the phosphates down. I hope this video has helped you guys and I hope it's opened up the world of phosphates for you and given you guys lots of different ways to help control phosphates within your aquarium. If you have any questions or comments or you would like me to make a video specifically for you, do me a favor and leave them in today's video down below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time guys, take care and God bless.